as we turn to God's word, we're going to be looking at Colossians chapter one. Let's once again seek his help. Father God, we thank you for your readiness to help us to understand glorious heavenly themes that are so far beyond the grasp of the greatest human mind and yet can be understood by the simplest child. Oh Lord, give us then that childlike trust in you and that wisdom from on high that would expand our minds to take hold of the glorious truths of the incarnation, God becoming flesh, taking on human form and all that that means for us as humans, uh, for this world and for eternity. Help us, we pray, and teach us by your spirit. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, maybe you've had that conversation or overheard a conversation where people would sort of say, rather than talking about the weather, they talk about Christmas and say, are you ready for Christmas? Oh, I should be glad when it's all over, comes the reply. But then they think, well, that sounds a bit miserable and scroogey. So, but it's nice for the children. to deal with that conversation? It's an opportunity, isn't it? So, well, why do you say that? Maybe they mean sort of a, a sentimental feels nice, doesn't it? Or maybe it's just that the children get so excited about all the presents and the decorations and getting together. I don't know. But it's an opportunity, isn't it, to actually say, well, actually at the core of the Christmas message is something that is way past children's understanding, way past my understanding. We sang it in our first hymn. Our God contracted to a span, a very small measurement, incomprehensibly made man. And that, that's the fundamental part of Christmas that just should blow our mind. It's not, it's not just kind of, oh, it's nice for the children. Yes, it is nice for the children, but it's so, so much more, isn't it? And the scriptures give us that fuller understanding. So that's my hope this morning as we look at Colossians chapter 1, we will grasp the wonder of the incarnation. And Paul is very clear, firstly, that we're speaking about one who is fully God. I'm going to dive straight into chapter 1 and verse 15. where he says that Jesus is the image of the invisible God. And it's a very specific word there. That means the exact representation. Hebrews chapter 1 verse 3 uses uh, that, that, that expression. Jesus is the ex express image of his person. He is fully God. He is the full revelation of God. I mean, sometimes if we think of an image, uh, we, we think of perhaps a a poor photocopy or a fax and it doesn't really bear much resemblance to the original. Uh, I have a receipt book at home and it used to be uh, you, have, you slip the piece of cardboard in, beside, in behind it and you write on it and what you write on it becomes uh, on the next page for your records because as the carbon fades so does the image that is progressing. Well I've upgraded now to a no carbon required one and you have to be careful how hard you press as to how far through the book that the uh, impression is made. But still, it, it does fade after a while. But with Jesus, th there is, he's not God the Father, but all that the God that the Father is can be found in Jesus, expressed in Jesus. Fully God, fully divine. We read at the beginning from John's opening of the Gospel in chapter 1 there. And he gives that clear understanding of the word of God, the full expression of all that is, all that is reasonable and logical, is fully God. But Paul goes on to say, he is the creator. Or well, by him, verse 16, by Jesus, all things were created. And it's very clear, isn't it, that he existed before the incarnation. It had to be true for him to be the full representation of God. But just to kind of add the layer upon layer of the incomprehensibility of all of this, he's showing that he existed before the creation, before his, his own 
Well, he's not, he wasn't created, was he? He's the uncreated son of God. But before he came to be in Bethlehem and was born in that way. So he was existing eternally. He was in the beginning with God. John 1 verse 1. So he's, he's fully God. He pre-exists. Uh, his appearance here, his manifestation here on earth. For he was present at the creation. He pre-exists all of creation he was the creator. All things were created. And not just earthly things in the creation. We can actually think about the creation of the heavens as well. But uh, we don't have very much, we don't have as much detail about that, do we, in Genesis? Lots of detail about how God made the things that we see here on earth. But here we get an insight that there was creation going on before that. And Jesus was the agent of that creation. Everything in the heavens, all the spiritual realm that is unseen to us. Jesus was the creator of it. So he's, he's majestic and glorious before, beyond our, our grasp in the heavenly realm. As the creator, he, he, he always was God and he remained God when he became a man. Now we do know in the scriptures, don't we, that from time to time, there was an appearance of something, someone, uh, that caused people to fall down in worship, often referred to as the angel of the Lord, or the technical term, the theophany, an appearance of God in a pre-incarnate form. And that helps us to understand that, yes, this Christ, the Son, existed before he was born uh, of, of the Virgin Mary, before he was conceived of the Holy Spirit. He didn't come as Jesus when he appeared to Abraham and to Joshua and to other Old Testament saints. But the, the description given in those accounts where they, the angel of the Lord appears makes it clear that here is one who is divine. Not God the Father, but God the Son in a pre-incarnate form. So previously he appeared to men. But now in the incarnation, he dwells among men. And that's a whole new phase of history. No wonder we uh, measure our years from that point, roughly speaking. Not quite, was it, 0 uh, AD um, when Jesus was born. But we, we've ordered our calendars. We're at 2022 AD, Anno Domini, because Jesus came. God came in the flesh in the person of Jesus. And that changes everything for our world, for our history. But by becoming human, of course, Jesus didn't become less God. This is the thing that kind of is so hard to, to grasp, isn't it? That he was fully God before the incarnation. And he then added to his nature, the, 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 the human nature, unified in one person, but two distinct persons. You couldn't sort of chop Jesus open and say, well, this bit's divine and, and this bit's human. There was that perfect melding together as he took on a human soul, a human body. And somehow that was almost absorbed into his divine personhood. It, it, it's beyond our grasp how one so glorious, so great, could be so humbled in that way. But in a sense, the, the, it dignifies our humanity, doesn't it? We often emphasise the sinfulness and the darkness of humans as they have rebelled against God. But it's not because Project Human was a mistake by God. There's a, there's a dignity to human nature. And that is shown by the Son of God taking human nature upon himself. In all perfection. And through that flesh that we'll be thinking about why he took on flesh a bit later on. But through that sanctifies it and makes it fit for God. As he laid aside his glory as the scriptures say and humbled himself. He didn't become less God. And he wasn't less than man. He was fully God. Fully man. So that he might live and die and ascend and he now reigns on high the scriptures tell us as the one who is the god man it's not that 
Okay, he's left earth, so he no longer needs to be given. He remains the God-man at God's right hand. He is the mediator between God and man. He's qualified to do that by what he did, by who he became. I hope it's a truth that we, we love to be reminded about. I'm hoping these truths are familiar to us, but that we just delight to be reminded of just how great our God is, how, how great the incarnation is, that we may be more and more amazed. And if we don't grasp it yet, believe it's true because the scriptures reveal it to us and uh, in case our minds have not got enough to be thinking about Paul goes on to speak about the supremacy of Christ he is preeminent and uh, when, he, when he describes him as being verse 15 the firstborn of all creation that, that's not about birth when I mean, the Bible's talking about firstborn, it's, it's not really to do necessarily with birth. It's to do with position. It's the position of the inheritor. So talk, calling him the firstborn doesn't mean that Jesus began his life. He was born into life in Bethlehem. We've seen he was pre-existent of that. He, he, he's eternal. But by describing him as the firstborn, it, it means he, he is the heir. He is the rightful heir that all he has made. All that he will redeem by his flesh is his inheritance, the world. It's his. As I mentioned in prayer, the very existence of this world is for the purpose of giving Christ supremacy. Verse 17, he's before all things, not just in terms of time, but in terms of position. And in him, all things hold together. He sustains it because the world and all he has made is going to be the means of him receiving the preeminence. <clears throat> Didn't happen on that first night when he was born. Although the shepherds came uh, and worship, there's not preeminence in all things, is there? Everybody else was just going about their everyday business, probably sleeping. But he came so that he might have the preeminence in keeping with his status as the one in whom all the fullness of the Godhead was pleased to dwell. So when we get involved in those Christmas conversations, can we make it our aim that we go beyond the manger, we go beyond the stable even, don't allow that just to be our, our focus. Yes, he came as a baby, but it's not just little baby Jesus. Here is the preeminent, glorious God. He cannot be belittled, cannot be ignored. He is the one who changes history. And I hope we've grasped that and can be ready to proclaim it. Well, we've glimpsed it. Uh, we've seen that he's fully God, but secondly, he's fully man. Uh, we've glimpsed that as we've gone through, but just to, to draw that out of the passage here, verse 20. Uh, through him, through Jesus, to reconcile to himself all things, uh, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. Before the incarnation, Jesus didn't have blood. But in taking on human nature, he had both a body uh, and blood. Verse 22, he is now reconciled in his body of flesh by his death in order to present you holy and blameless, etc. So you had to have a human body, he had to have human blood so that they might be given to pay the price for sin. As the Bible tells us that God the Father is spirit. Those who worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. And so we presume that the pre-incarnate form of the Son of God was similar, spirit. And to enact a physical material transaction he needed to have the right currency Jesus needed to have the body and blood that was necessary to be given in place of those who had uh, rejected God those who had forfeited uh, the body and blood that was fitting for God you know, we, we, we transgressed and we ruined our human nature 
made in the image of God, for God and for the glory of God. We, we forfeited that in our sin. But Jesus takes on flesh and blood by dying. And in dying, he brings that substitutionary work that was needed, that redemption plan. And that's what Paul also mentioned there in verse, uh, well, so we've seen it uh, in verse 14. In Jesus, we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. A similar idea in verse 20 that we've also read about reconciling. He had to be one of us to represent us. He had to experience what humans experience in all our limitations, the weakness of human flesh, getting tired, being in one place at one time. All of these things were uniquely human experiences for the God man. But he had to do that to effectively obey the will of the Father to give his life in place of those who had forfeited their life. We know from the scriptures that he was perfect in every part, that sin did not corrupt him in any way in his incarnation, in his birth, or in any of his acts or words, thoughts. He was sinless, so that he might present that perfect offering to God the Father and pay the price of redemption. And that was always the plan, right from those early days when Adam and Eve had turned from God and rebelled and brought a curse upon them, the curse of death because of their sin and rebellion. God had promised that the seed of the woman, a, a true human being, would crush the head of the serpent who had caused humans to turn away from God, to fall from their exalted position in God's sight. And sure enough, Jesus fulfills that prophecy and the many prophecies that God sent down through the generations following that he would come uh, as prophet, priest and king to redeem his people so that man might again give the glory due to the name of the Lord with sin put away. So it's no wonder then perhaps that Given the greatness of who Jesus was and the work that he was to accomplish, it's no wonder that his very birth was opposed by Satan, trying to thwart this, this plan through Herod. That's the, the bit of the uh, nativity play that often doesn't <clears throat> see the light of day in our primary schools and so on. Uh, a murderous Herod committing genocide in the area of uh, Bethlehem, killing all those little baby boys. But such is the, the opposition of the powers of darkness to God that they would stop at nothing to try and stop Christ from having the preeminence. Of course, Satan, Satan was thrown out of heaven because he wanted the preeminence. He wanted to sit on the throne. And that was not his place to be. It was not right for him to do that. And he was punished. But that hasn't stopped him from trying uh, to prevent Jesus for whom are all things and through whom are all things from receiving the preeminence amongst the human beings that Satan has succeeded in turning from God. And still he is at work. And perhaps this time of the year, people may go to a church. The one time of the year they go to a service. They might give some thought. They might sing something about Christ. But he's even using that to lead them further into error. To just turn this into a, a cute time. A time of fun and festivities and, and all that goes with that. Oh, to be thankful for times of enjoyment together. But only as it enhances our understanding of Jesus. And the glory and preeminence that he receives. And not use it as an opportunity just for self-serving, self-indulgence. And of course, Satan, we know, uses many other tactics. He was trying to keep these people from giving the preeminence to Christ in Colossae by bringing them into error. And God has graciously given us the scriptures to correct that and to teach us. He also permits us to go into times of trial and temptation. 
so that we might show the reality of the faith that we are given in defiance of the work of Satan who is trying to kill that faith and turns away from our purpose if we are in Christ to give the preeminence to Christ. Well, we pray for our persecuted brothers and sisters around the world as they face the very real consequences of giving Christ first place against evil powers who would seek to stop that. Well, fully God, fully man, and that has consequences for us then. That we could be those who fully know. As I said before the reading, the Colossians were under attack from false teachers who were saying that they needed something more, uh, that, that they didn't have all the fullness of understanding of who Jesus was. And Paul has been showing them and praying for them that they would see something of the awesome truths about the Saviour, about Jesus. And that they would know him more and more, verse 9 and 10. He's given their prayer report. We've not ceased to pray for you, asking that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will in all spiritual wisdom and understanding, so as to walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to him, bearing fruit in every good work, and increasing in the knowledge of God. As they understood more of who he really was, as Paul's been setting out from verse 15, and why he came, and the, the wonders of the incarnation that we've been thinking about, then they would be more in tune with their purpose, more of an insight into the heavenly realities that are true in them, as they see what Jesus became and continues to be, and what he did for the sake of believers. What a privilege it is to know him and to be drawn into these spiritual realities as those who are reconciled to God. Those who are part of the body of which he is the head, the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. There is sufficient in the truths taught in the scriptures about the person of Jesus uh, for us to, to know fully and yet to know more and more. And so these things are simple and yet they are so deep and profound. May we never just settle for uh, just a, a kind of a baby in the manger view of the incarnation. Let me see beyond that to the cross, to the glory of heaven itself, and the glory that will be ours because of what happened that night in Bethlehem. So that our hope for salvation will never be placed anywhere other than this Jesus, born as a baby, but reigning on high. And what we know will then impact what we do, who we are in our own estimation. And uh, that's been a big theme of the, the verses uh, just before our main section, verses 15 onwards. Just before that, he's been saying that his desire in telling them all of this is that they may be fully pleasing. So it's, it's not just building up knowledge so that we're clever people, so that we can show off whatever it might be. We would know more and more of Jesus so that we might be fully pleasing in the sight of God. We've read it already, verse 10. Work in a uh, walk, live in a manner worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to him, bearing fruit in every good work. We saw last week, didn't we? Jesus' illustration and promise that we would bear much fruit if we abide in Christ. We're going to abide in Christ when we really fully know who he is and why he had to be that way. That he might save us. So yes we should be awestruck. We should be comforted by who Jesus is. And what he's done. But it should impact how we live. The walk that we go on. Putting things into practice. That our every step would be seeking to, to please him. To live worthy. To, to, to live in a way that's in keeping with our status. And what he's done for us. Who he's called us to be. What a change. We were, verse 21, once alienated and hostile in mind. And that showed in the deeds that we did that were evil. But now he's reconciled in his body of flesh by his death in order to present us holy and blameless 
and above reproach before him. We're now inheritors. He's qualified us, verse 12, to share in the inheritance of the saints in light. What a transformation. Those enslaved to evil deeds, those who are wicked by any uh, measure of wickedness, but now saints and participants of the light of glory. I hope as we think about Christmas, we're full of thanksgiving for what happened then, what it means for us now, and for all the hope that that sets forward for the next year that lies ahead of us. With all of the, the, the trials and afflictions, all the doubts and the fears that may come upon us, that we are those who are called uh, to be strengthened, verse 11, with all power, according to his glorious might, for all endurance and patience with joy. He's done this great deed of coming here to earth. Would he then just shut up shop and hold back all that we need? No, he will give us the strength that we need. He's at work by the power of his resurrection. He speaks about Jesus being the firstborn from the dead. And that resurrection power is at work in the lives of all who put their trust in him. So that we may be those who endure in patience with joy. Well, I hope we have opportunity to express something of that to those who want to just make Christmas for the children. May we grasp something of the wonder of the Incarnation and tell it on. To welcome childlike faith in the simple truths that are revealed in the Gospel. But not just be complacent to settle for that, but to grow more and more in our understanding, in our knowledge of God, in our obedience to God, in our service of God. That we would be those who bow down and worship this is your God. Let's pray. Well, we ask for minds to be able to grasp the heights of your love, the breadth of your grace. Just how far Jesus came for us, how he's freely given us all that we need. That we might be exalted to the glories of heaven. Give us understanding then of this wonderful truth that we celebrate at this time of the year. May we be humble in receiving this greatest of gifts and express our love for you in lives that are fruitful and pleasing in your sight because of the work of Jesus. Help us then to glorify God in our obedience, in our hearts, in our fellowship one with another, for the glory of his name. Amen.